All right, guys and gals, we are uh, back after a short little break. We are honored to have uh, Mike Wolf join us today. Now, Mike is a rock star doing some amazing things. He's an investor, mentor, international speaker, and a philanthropist. Uh, he's done investing in both Canada and the U.S. for over 30 years now. And Mike and his team have done literally thousands of real estate transactions. And now Mike helps others duplicate his success by also teaching them how to do the things that he does. And so, uh, so many people over the past years have always said, hey, I want to learn more about tax liens, the tax deeds, stuff like that. And uh, this guy is doing it remotely from where he lives, doing a lot of it in Harris County, Texas. That's Houston, Texas, uh, here in the Lone Star State. So, uh, which Texas is one of the most desirable states when it comes to that type of investing. So we're honored to have Mike join us. Uh, what's up, brother? You doing all right today? I'm doing, I'm living the dream, you know. I'm uh, stuck in Canada. Not that that's a bad place to be right now, but uh, I'm, I'm used to, uh, I, I, as you know, I travel a lot. I usually travel full time. And so... Uh, I feel like I have my wings clipped a little bit, but uh, it's been good. Gave me some downtime so I could be on your show. So it all worked out good. Yeah, no, we're, we're honored to have you here on Note Camp uh, 2020, another first Thank time uh, speaker to the event. And, uh, you know, I agree. If I'm, I'm ready. I think everybody's going a little stir crazy. Yeah. The airlines, when they finally do open up stuff, I think people are, are definitely going to jump on a plane or go somewhere yeah. to get the fuck out of Dodge. on the first flight. <laughs> yeah, right, More exactly. Profitable. <laughs> yeah, somewhere yeah. tropical is exactly right there. It's where I usually have been the last three years around this time, but we're yeah. glad to be here. Uh, you've got a presentation I think you, you want to pull up. I do. There. I do. Right. And we'll see if the technology works because this I'm, I'm much better at real estate than technology. So just uh, disclosure here. That's so okay. You got your PowerPoint open on your screen already or up, pulled up before you hit share screen? Okay. I think I got it. Oh, sorry. Did you say something before I hit share screen? Nope. Okay. You're good. You just got to go to presentation node or now. Okay, good. Am I okay? Can can you actually see my screen right now? Or you're still I can seeing? see your screen. Yep. Yeah. Let's see. Full All right, screen. good. You just need to go to presentation mode there. Oh, there you go. Perfect. There you go. Yeah. How's that? Perfect. Now you want? Do you want questions answered during or wait till the end? What would you? I'm good. Yeah. People want to ask questions. Uh, yeah, they feel free. Um, I'm happy to answer anything. And uh, I can't if they're doing a chat box. I don't know how to do this and the chat box at the same time. But I will handle that as questions pop up if they're relevant. I'll jump in and moderate. They can wait till the very end because I know I'll I'll wait to the end. But I'll jump off camera. But I'll be here. All right. You're not okay, alone. Sounds good. And just so. Uh, People know, if you ask a question that I know I'm going to cover for sure, then I'm just going to, uh, you know, I'll just say, hey, we're, we're getting to that. So perfect. Uh, there we go. So anyway, uh, welcome. I'm, I'm glad you could all be here. And, you know, tax liens and deeds, and I'm actually going to talk about, I, I added a little bonus content. I'm going to talk about overages as well. Uh, it's one of those uh, topics that I wasn't sure if it was real or not. You know, back in the days, I was always hearing about this. And I've been doing this for 30, I've been doing real estate for 30 years. I didn't start doing tax liens and deeds till about 10 years ago. And the reason I didn't is it just seems so confusing. Like there's so much misinformation out there, so much conflicting information. I remember when I was trying to learn it, I, I took some courses and read a whole, you know, every book I could find on the topic. And the more I read, the more confused I got because, you know, some, some books would say, oh, well, you do it this way. Other books would say you do it that way. And so today I want to talk to you about what's true, what's false, you know, what are the misconceptions? Uh, I basically have to make myself a human guinea pig. And uh, I, I tested a lot of different things and lost the money to try to figure out how to do this properly. Uh, and now, you know, I've been doing it pretty solidly for the last nine years or so. I've got a really good team uh, in Houston, Texas is my personal favorite place uh, to do this strategy. I'm going to explain why a, a little bit later on. Uh, but I'm going to teach you how you can uh, capitalize on liens and deeds and how you get started, because that's really the, the uh, tough part, is figure out where, you know, where do you even go to get, get started in the first place. So uh, you kind of touched on most of the stuff of what I do. Uh, you know, I've been on, on the media, I've, I've spoken internationally. Uh, most important thing on there is that I'm a father, I'm a, I have two grandkids, uh, and I love to give back. And so to me, everything I do has to be a win-win. So I'm going to teach you a lot of people, especially these days, are... are I know a lot of people that I talk to are saying, oh, I'm, I don't really, you know, I feel bad becoming a real estate investor because there's all these people right now post COVID and they're going to be struggling and I don't want to take advantage of them. Well, you don't have to do that. You can actually go out there and help people and get paid for it. I'm going to show you how. So we're going to get to that. Uh, so first of all, why do I love real estate? I mean, after all, homes, their drywall, their windows, their doors. How do you fall in love with real estate investing? 
Well, to me, I don't really like the term real estate investor so much. I love the term problem solver. And, you know, whenever uh, you have a, a pandemic like this or uh, a recession, there's always going to be a whole lot of people that are going to be struggling. And, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, back in the days, I used to have a company called Foreclosure Fixers. And what I would do is I would actually, you know, sit across the table from people that were uh, losing their homes. And a lot of these people had no idea that there was a legal process. They thought somebody was going to come in two in the morning, kick them and their kids out, throw everything on the front lawn, and that, that's how they would lose, you know, that they were going to lose their home. And uh, I had, uh, I would sit across and sometimes I'd lend them, actually lend them money to bail them out of foreclosure. Because sometimes bad things happen to good people. We're going to see a lot of that, you know, in the next little bit with, you know, people losing their jobs, et cetera. And so sometimes I'd bail them out and they would just pay me back. Other people, I knew if I loaned them money, they would never be able to afford to pay me back. And some people just, live beyond their means. And instead I would, you know, give them the solution where I would buy their home, but I'd always make sure that they had, you know, a damage deposit and a few months rent and, and money for food. And then I'd help them because, you know, these people, sometimes bad things happen to them, but guess what? Eventually they're going to bounce back. And that would, you know, you'd help them when they were, uh, give them a soft landing on the way down and then you'd get to help them on the way back up. But anyway, I, I remember one time I got, um, I had a lady call me up and she said, Mike, I, I never told you this, but the day that I got your, your, your foreclosure flyer, uh, your foreclosure fixer flyer, say that 10 times fast. Uh, I was actually thinking of killing myself that day. And then your, your flyer came in the mail saying you could fix the foreclosure. And so you don't know the number of problems you're solving for people. You're not just helping people with their home. You're not just helping them with their financial issues because behind the scenes, if somebody has financial issues, they've also got, I guarantee you their relationships are not going well. Uh, they've got lots of stress, they're probably depressed, uh, their health isn't going to be good. So you get to help people with a lot of things that you don't even sometimes know that you're helping them with. And that's one of the reasons why I love real estate, because I love people. Uh, and every deal to me should be a win-win. And I'm going to explain to you how, you know, a lot of people don't see tax deeds as a win-win because they don't really understand it. Because they think, oh, these people lost their home and now we're going to talk about that. So... Uh, but behind every real estate transaction is a story. Nobody randomly wakes up in the morning and puts a for sale sign on their lawn. There's always a story behind it. And so sometimes uh, it says, uh, there's a little bit of, no kids I hope are, are on your show, Scott, but it says house for sale by owner because my neighbor is an asshole. So sometimes it's neighbor problems. Uh, husband left us for a 22 year old house for sale by scorned, slightly better, newly single owner. Uh, sometimes it's uh, you know, divorce. And uh, owner ready to croak must sell. So we see, you know, people, uh, you know, uh, obviously we're getting older, uh, not me, not Scott, but some people are getting older and eventually, uh, you know, it's time to maybe move down or move, in, move into a nursing home or whatever the case may be. So there's nice. always something, there's always a reason behind it. So in the case of uh, liens and deeds, the reason behind homes uh, going for sale is that the county needs this money. This property tax goes towards uh, their roads, their schools, police department, fire department. And so uh, sometimes you think, oh, you know, I feel really bad for that person. These people, a lot of cases, they've been warned by, this, by the uh, county for like four years that, hey, your home is eventually gonna go to, if you don't pay, eventually we're gonna put your home for auction. They've had chance after chance after chance. And in, in uh, Texas, where you are, Scott, my favorite place to do this strategy, even after you buy their home, they're given another chance. So you don't really have to feel sorry for them because otherwise they're gonna close down schools and there's gonna be no police, which I know some people might want right now. Uh, but under normal circumstances, we want police, we want a fire department, we want our schools open and we want roads. So, uh, but the interesting thing is that this has been around, there's always been a way to deal with delinquent tax, you know, taxpayers uh, since there were taxes invoked like over 200 years ago. And so I find it really uh, ironic that this has been around so many years and yet so many people don't understand it and don't know how to do it. So we're gonna talk about why that's the case in a few minutes. Um, but uh, so first we're gonna start off, I, I wanna say that tax liens and tax deeds are two very different things. Now they both serve the same purpose. They both help the county uh, with delinquent taxpayers, but they handle it in different ways. So a tax lien, the, the thing you have to remember if you're a tax lien investor is you're not getting ownership to a property. In most places, and by the way, every county does things a little bit differently. So everything I'm telling you is a, a bit of a generalization because I can't tell you a list, every single county what they're doing. But in general, if you're buying a, a tax lien, you're getting what's called a TLC or tax lien certificate. 
And what that uh, taxing certificate means, let's say Scott uh, gets his tax bills and, and uh, it says, Scott, your taxes are $1,000 are due on uh, June 1st. Sorry to pick on you, Scott, but you're the only person I, whose name I see. So June 1st, uh, it says, you know, his taxes are $1,000. Uh, Scott decides not to pay. And so he gets something in the mail saying, hey, we're, we're giving you, a, you're, you're being penalized. And it's a 10% penalty. You now owe us $1,100. Well, the county still needs that money. They can't tell their police chief, oh, well, we'll pay you when Scott pays his taxes. They can't do that. And so they need the money right away. So they'll sell that certificate to somebody like myself or somebody like you, and you'll pay the $1,000. The county's gonna keep bugging Scott to pay. And when Scott finally pays that 1,100, they're gonna give you the 1,100. You paid 1,000, you get 1,100. Now, sometimes I used a 10% example. There's states that have liens as high as 24%. Uh, so it doesn't have to necess necessarily be 10%. Sounds really good in theory. And, and you know, it's, it's obviously a lot better than keeping your money in the bank. But I'm going to show you in a few minutes why I greatly prefer tax deeds. Uh, but there's also a second uh, part to that. Every county has a uh, certain amount of time that's called a redemption period. And that's kind of the, the final, final chance that Scott has to get caught up. So it might be, let's say, two years. So second year, same thing happens, the, uh, you know, he gets another assessment in the mail, he still hasn't paid the previous year, now he gets another one saying, you know, you're, we're gonna penalize you again. And at some point when that redemption period ends, uh, you know, Scott's not gonna have any more chances. Uh, he's gonna basically, uh, you know, at this point, if you bought the tax lien certificates, you're in a position now where you can foreclose on Scott. And I'm not, not sure how many of you remember uh, back in, the, especially in the 90s, there, there were a lot of infomercials and it showed somebody holding a paycheck and said, I bought this home for $500. Well, that was, those are tax liens. Now, the truth of the matter is they look really, that, I mean, that sounds really exciting. You, you, you pay, a th you know, in this case, a thousand bucks, or maybe for two years, you pay 2000 bucks, and now you're gonna get the home. In, in, in theory, it sounds amazing. In practice, what happens is tax liens, probably 2% of the time, you're gonna get the property, if you're lucky. So most of the time, you're just gonna get that interest, which is fine, like I said, better than the bank, but, uh, part of, you know, there, there's, some, there's some pluses to it. It's hands-off investing. In most places, the county does the heavy lifting for you. They're going to be the ones bugging Scott. Some places it's actually against the law for you to contact the homeowner. Uh, in some places you can. Uh, you don't need a lot of money to start. You know, the vast majority of tax liens are actually under, uh, you know, a thousand bucks. So they're, they're usually very small amounts. You can start with very little money. And, and like I said, county's doing most of the work. The, um, you know, the, as I mentioned, the homeowner has a redemption period and at the uh, end of the redemption period, if you're super lucky, you might get this home for pennies on the dollar. Most of the time you're gonna get that interest. Um, uh, before we go to tax deeds, I, want, I just wanna cover though the, the downside because I don't want you to just go think, hey, everything's all rosy, you're gonna invest some money, you're gonna get a really nice return. The, the problem with it is most of the time, that 2% of the time when you do get the property, Usually there's a reason why the uh, homeowner is going to let that go for such a small amount of money. And quite often, uh, the, you know, the reason is, I'll give you an example. Let's say it's a vacant piece of land and that piece of land is absolutely worthless. A lot of times builders have a little strip of land left over. They're not going to do anything with it. They don't want to pay tax on it. Sometimes it might be contaminated. And when you get ownership, even though you got the ownership for very, very cheap, now that asset is also your liability and you're responsible you know, maybe there's a gas station on there at one point, and now it's going to cost you $100,000 to, to make that land safe again. So with ownership comes liability. And so you need to do the due diligence on what you're going to potentially own. And the problem with that is if you're only making a hundred bucks, how much due diligence, how much money do you want to invest in due diligence? How much research do you want to do? So that's one of the problems with tax liens. And one of the reasons why uh, I have, I have a good friend, by the way, and he does it institutionally. He's buying these in, in, large amounts uh, from uh, counties. And for him, it makes a lot of sense because uh, you know, if you're buying that many, you're getting a discount for doing it. Uh, it makes, you can do very, very well with it. And he's got a whole legal team that deals with it. And he buys in places where he can contact the homeowners and he makes deals with them. He's doing very, very well, but most individual investors that I see doing it, you know, you might make little bits here and there, but I'm gonna show you why deeds, in my opinion, is a lot better strategy. So one, in most places, and Texas isn't one of them, but in most places, there's no redemption period 
uh, on a tax deed. Tax deed, you're actually, when you're the winning bidder at the auction, you're actually owning a property. You get the full deed. Uh, you can do whatever you want with it. And uh, everything drops off in, in most cases. And, and uh, I want you to really, if you're taking notes, write down in most cases because it's not always the case. So when you buy these homes, and I've had, you know, I've had some of my students pick up properties for like $7,000 uh, and you know, the auctions just are sorry, the, the mortgages get wiped out. So the mortgage holders get informed by the county, hey, this home's going up for auction. You have the right to uh, pay off the arrears if you want. If you don't, your mortgages are, are, are gone, they get wiped out. And so you can get properties for really, really uh, cheap. In most cases, like I said, there's no redemption period, you don't have to wait. And you can move into the home, you can, you can rent it out, you can flip it, you can do whatever you want with the property once you get it. So uh, here's a map that shows the different states and you know, what strat, you know, what, uh, you know, whether it's a lean state or a deed state. So all these uh, green ones, they're your lean states. So if you're looking to do deeds like I do, you're gonna look either for these uh, reddish, pinkish, I'm a little bit colorblind, so I think, I think that's red. It could be pink. Uh, you're gonna look for those states. Those are your deed states. Uh, then we have uh, some states that actually, depending on the county, like if you go to Florida, some parts of Florida are liens and some parts of Florida are deeds. And then if you go to places like uh, Texas, uh, Georgia, Tennessee, uh, Connecticut, uh, and uh, Hawaii, they have redeemable deeds. And redeemable deed, what that means is that when you get the property, the previous owner has another chance. And so uh, to me, the, the reason I like redeemable deeds, whereas you know, in theory, it sounds like, well, wouldn't you rather just go to a deed state and own the property right away? The, the problem with that is you have a lot of institutional investors out there with huge amounts of money and they wanna go where it's easy. They don't wanna go and figure out, well, oh, the homeowner might come back in six months. Well, we can't flip it, we can't rent it. What are we gonna do with it? And actually you can rent it during that six month period. And if you're creative and, and this is some of the stuff that I teach, you can actually flip it in that six month period too. But these institutional investors and most other investors, they want uh, to do, you know, take the simplest path to making a paycheck. And what I, what I encourage uh, you guys, and I know that you got, I'm preaching to the choir because you're taking time on a Saturday to be learning uh, while other people are watching Netflix, uh, you're here. So if you go a, a little step further than what other investors are willing to do, that's where the gold is a lot of times. And so uh, if you're willing to take one or two extra steps, uh, you can make a big paycheck. Now you have to be careful, not all redeemable deed states are created equal. Georgia, for example, and I haven't, I haven't done deeds there. This is what I've heard from, from somebody else. So don't quote me on it. Uh, but in Georgia, they have a one year redemption period. And during that one year, you can't do anything to the property. You can't fix it. You can't flip it. You can't rent it. You can't live in it. So you have to, your ba basically your money is tied up. Now, within that year, if the previous homeowner wants to come back, they've got to give you a 20% premium. So that's a good thing, but I don't want to wait a whole year and have my money just sitting there doing nothing. I want to, I want to get my money working for me. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about Texas in a minute and why I love Texas. And that was before I met Scott. Now I like it even more. So, um, but, so tax deeds are a great strategy to get started you know, if you don't have that much cash to play with. And like I said, I've had students pick up you know, single family homes for seven grand. I'm going to show you an example here in a minute of one that one of my students got for 15,000. Uh, you can get vacant land for under a thousand bucks quite often. And I've got students, that's all they do. They buy vacant land and they flip it. They're selling it to developers and builders and they're making pretty good money doing it. And by the way, vacant land, not as exciting. Everybody always wants to go for those pretty homes, uh, but vacant land, uh, there's less competition on that. So, you know, you can win those consist more consistently than you can the single family. So, um, you know, one, one of the things you need to do though, is I know it all sounds rosy, it sounds easy, you just go to the auction, you get the list, go to the auction, start bidding. Remember before I said there, you know, uh, mortgages sometimes get wiped out. There's a whole lot of things that can happen. There's a whole lot of landmines out there. And you know, like I said, when I first tried to learn this, that was a problem. I remember I took one course and they said, oh, you can do this from the comfort of your own home. Well, you can do it from the comfort of your own home if you don't mind losing your shirt, because uh, one of the things that I do on my uh, trainings, I do them in Houston, Texas, and we uh, spend two days in the classroom. Day three, we go driving for dollars. We go driving around the city, looking at these properties. And, you know, we've seen some that look amazing in the pictures. They, they tell you, yeah, you just go on Google Maps and look at the pictures and you're going to be fine. Well, we've looked at some that looked amazing in the pictures. And then when we were driving around, there were a bunch of ashes where a home used to stand. And 
when you buy at these auctions, the thing you need to know is that you've got no recourse. Whatever you buy, what you see is what you get. You cannot go back to the county and say, oh, well, there's this beautiful picture of a home. Half the time, the picture that uh, the county puts on their website of the home is the next door neighbor's home in a lot of cases. So you need to really do your research. Now, the good news is it doesn't need to be you. I don't live in Houston, Texas. I have my team there that goes and you know, videotapes the properties for me in the streetscape. And the one thing that you also need to know if you've never been to Houston and Scott will, I know you're, I think you're in Austin, you're somewhere else in Texas, but uh, if, if anybody who's been to Houston will tell you that there's no zoning there. And so you could have a beautiful single family home that looks great in a picture next to a strip joint, next to a pawn shop, next to an apartment building, next to a vacant land with horses on it. So you, you need to know not just what does that home look like, you need to know what does that street look like because you don't know what you're getting yourself into. So you really need to do a lot of due diligence. And there's, um, like I said, a lot of misinformation as to what that due diligence should be. So I'm gonna clear up some of that. Uh, here is a example of uh, what somebody who wasn't educated on tax deeds bought recently. This is in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, he bought a villa, what he thought was a villa. He paid uh, a little under $10,000 for, uh, see this little strip of land here? It's 100 feet long between the garages, 100 feet long and one foot wide, and that's what he bought, thinking he was buying one of the, uh, the villas here, and which would have been worth 200,000. Instead, he got a worthless piece of land, and that was, uh, he was very upset, and he started accusing the county of ripping him off, and you know they state very, very clearly, it's up to you to do your due diligence, and so he did not win against the county. He basically lost his 10K, and now he owns, he's a proud owner of that piece of land that he now gets to pay property tax on every year, so lucky him and insurers, because if somebody actually got injured on there, he would have to uh, pay. So uh, you have to be really careful what you're doing. Uh, on the other side of the equation, oh, I thought I had another picture in here, where did it go? Um, oh, it comes later, about a really good success story. So it's not all doom and gloom. If you do things properly, there's some really big wins, uh, but we'll get to that. Um, one of the things you need to realize is that during chaotic times like we're in right now, this is when you're gonna find the most profitable, I mean, you're gonna have more people not being able to afford their property taxes and also not, you know, making their mortgage payments. And when people get behind on their mortgage payments, they also don't pay their property taxes. So we're gonna see more and more of, uh, you know, going forward. The other thing you need to know is right, you know, this past few months, as many of you are aware, there's been a moratorium on foreclosure. So the county is not, uh, is not foreclosing on people. They're not uh, kick, you know, they're not taking these, there, there have been no auctions uh, for obvious reasons. And so what you have when you have like a six month moratorium on something and then you open the floodgates and all of a sudden things get back to normal and the banks can start, you know, foreclosing on people and the counties are going to start foreclosing. What's that is, what that will mean is a whole lot more opportunity. And I mean, and when I say opportunity, I don't want you to think we're being vultures and taking advantage of people while they're down because I'm gonna tell you how you can get to these people even before it goes to auction and try to save them doing my foreclosure fixers method. And I'm, gonna I'm actually gonna show you three different ways to make money. You can make money before the auction, during the auction, and after the auction. So we're gonna to get to that. Um, you have to realize more people became millionaires during the 1930s depression than any other time in American history. Uh, I believe this next huge transfer of wealth that's coming up is gonna far exceed that in a lot of ways. Uh, it's hard to say, I don't have a crystal ball, but that would be my guess. Uh, just because it's so, you know, the, the, you know, when we look at 2007, 2008, uh, create a lot of opportunity, but that was caused by the banks. It was caused by the real estate itself. And it was a much different uh, scenario than what we're facing now. Now we've got a whole bunch of people that, you know, the, the whole world shifted. You know, a lot of people's jobs are, not, are just not gonna be there when the dust settles. These things are, are gonna be eliminated. And it's not all doom and gloom. There's gonna be new businesses set up. But if you were in retail, for example, uh, re, you know, retail stores are, are shutting down big time. Uh, I know here in, in Calgary, where I am right now, uh, a lot of restaurants are not gonna be opening back up. There's gonna be a huge transfer of wealth. And, and now's your opportunity to take advantage of that in an ethical way. So. Uh, a lot of people ask me, like, if this is such a great strategy, why haven't I heard of it? Well, the reason you haven't heard of it is there's not a lot of people that can really benefit from teaching you it. Most realtors don't know about it, but if they did, they're not going to say, oh, don't buy a home for me off the MLS. I, you just go, find, go to the auction. You're going to get a way better deal. They, they lose paychecks that way, so they're not going to teach you. The banks, guess what? They, when you're depositing your money, what are they doing with it? There's some of the competition. They're going to these auctions, and they're buying these liens and deeds. 
So uh, there's a lot of people that don't want you to know about it because they just they want you to give you know give them your money and then they can go do it uh, to make money themselves. So there's, there's not really anybody who benefits from it except for there's the odd person uh, like myself that's willing to train it. Most of the most uh, successful people that do this, uh, they don't train other people because they don't want to create more competition. For me. I have a lot of other projects on the go, and this to me is, is, you know, this is a great strategy, by the way, for people that want to get one property or two properties here and there. You're not, you know, I want, I want to be transparent. You're not going to go to the auction and say, I'm going to buy 10 properties this month. It'd be very unlikely for you to be able to pick up 10. You might be able to pick up one or two, uh, you, and some of us are going to come home empty-handed. Now, I have a, a big turnkey operation in Atlanta where I sell properties that are already fixed up, and we we sell... Uh, before COVID, we were selling one home every two to three days. So this auction does not give me enough inventory to satisfy my uh, demand. So originally when I went to these auctions and I tried to figure this out, it was so I could get my inventory to help investors who want turnkey properties. And when I found out I couldn't get enough volume to make it worth my while, then I decided, you know, I've got all these students that come to me all the time with little or no money and they want to learn how to do, uh, you know, what strategy can they do where they can start off with very little and turn that into something relatively quick. And once again, I wanna caution you, uh, none of the things I'm teaching you are get rich quick. It, you know, the stuff that I teach, you've gotta actually go and take action. I make it easy, because I get, I actually, for my students, I give them my team. So my team does a lot of the work, but you still have to do some of the due diligence of the research. So even though you have a team, you have to be the quarterback of the team. So that's a long way of, of uh, saying that, you know, none of this stuff is get rich quick, and you're actually gonna to have to do some work to get the paychecks. And you're going to get better at it the more you do this, but you're, you're even, even somebody who knows how to do it perfectly, you're almost never going to get more than two properties per auction. It's, I haven't seen that. So uh, also, why would somebody let their home go to auction? A lot of people are skeptical. You know, why would somebody lose? You know, we see homes. If, if one of my students picked up a home for, for $7,000, why would somebody lose their home over seven grand? Well, first of all, they may have a mortgage on uh, top of that they're not, not paying. They might have a whole bunch of other debt. But sometimes it's, you know, they lose their job, which we're going to see a lot of now, uh, you know, obviously estate sales. Uh, a lot of times people inherit properties. And, you know, if you're watching the show, chances are if you inherit a property, that's like awesome. I mean, you don't want your friends and relatives to die uh, to get a property. But if you do get a property, that's like a good thing. But for other people who are not in this business and, you know, you uh, inherit this property, you don't know what to do with it. Uh, it's sitting there empty. Or, or maybe full of crap. And uh, you know, now you get a property tax bill. It's like, I don't wanna pay a property tax bill. Why did I get this stupid property? What am I supposed to do with it? So a lot of people inherit properties they don't want. Uh, but one of, the, one of the most interesting things is sometimes people just don't in, uh, update their info with accounting. This is the picture I wanted to show you, or actually not the picture, a, uh, a, a news story. So for those of you who don't know, Wayne Hazinga, is, uh, I think he's passed away now. He was a, a billionaire. And he, he uh, had the record for having the most Fortune 500 companies. He started the Waste Management Company, Blockbuster Video, et cetera, et cetera. And he uh, had, if you've ever been to Fort Lauderdale and you've taken those water taxis and you go around looking at all these beautiful, beautiful homes, he, own, he owns tons and tons of real estate all along that waterway uh, am amongst other things that he owned. And uh, he had his assistant, he changed offices and he had his assistant change the address on all his properties, except she forgot to do one. And that one property ha uh, happened to be worth around a million dollars, give or take. Uh, it was for tax purposes, they said 700,000. Uh, the officials thought it was worth around a million because uh, it's owned for a shopping center. Anyway, that, it doesn't really matter. The bottom line is uh, some investors picked it up at an auction. Uh, opening bid was $22,500. They got this million dollar piece of property for 47,500 bucks. So, uh, there are some great success stories. Now, the interesting thing is Wayne Hazinga actually called up the county after and tried, he actually tried to sue them and basically said, well, you know who I am. You know that, uh, you know, I obviously have $22,000 to pay the arrears. Why don't you let me know? And he lost because the county did exactly what they were supposed to do. And what they're supposed to do is send notice to the address on record that, hey, your home is, here's your tax bill. This is what it's due and he failed to do it. So he ended up losing and these investors got this smoking deal and I wish it was me, uh, but they got this million dollar property for 47,000 bucks. So there are some great success stories. Now, just once again, reality check. Uh, I have never had a deal like this come my way, uh, but you never know. So, um, 
So let's talk about Texas for a bit. And that's actually my favorite place to do this because like I said, uh, one of the reasons is it's a little bit less competitive now, not to say that there's no competition. You're not gonna go to the auction and be the only one there. There's gonna be other people there. And uh, a lot of times you're gonna get outbid on the properties that you want. But um, if you are uh, gonna go to Texas, which is what I, uh, you know, as I mentioned, my favorite place, if you look at what's called the Texaplex, which basically forms a triangle. If you look at the top, you've got Dallas, Fort Worth area, bottom left is San Antonio, bottom right is uh, Houston. If you look within that triangle, that's where the vast majority of population and growth is gonna happen. And that is where I'd recommend, you know, in, within there, if you're, if you're gonna do real estate, that's where I personally uh, would do it. And Scott may have other ideas because he actually lives there and he may be a little bit more knowledgeable in Texas. But that's where you wanna go in terms of the tax deeds. The small little uh, towns, uh, by, by the way, in, in the big cities uh, it, within Texas, they have an auction the first Tuesday of every month. Now it's been shut down for the last three or four months for obvious reasons, but normally it's the first Tuesday of every month. The little towns sometimes only have an auction maybe once a year and there might be three properties. So uh, if, if your whole yearly income is based on one auction a year, uh, you're gonna be broke. So do other things uh, on top of that if that's your strategy. Um, but the thing I love about Texas is like I said, it's a redeemable deed, which to me is kind of a hybrid of liens and deeds. It's kind of the best of both worlds. And here's what I mean by that. So if you get a, if you're the winning bidder at the auction, uh, you're either going to get that property free and clear. Uh, but like I said, the, the uh, previous owner retains one right. You have the right, uh, full rights to that property. Like I said, you can rent it, live in it. Flipping it is a little bit more creative. Uh, there are ways to do that. Uh, but the bottom line is after six months, uh, the homeowner has, if they want to redeem it, has to give you 25% more than what you paid for the property plus a 25% premium on any necessary work that you did to the property. And so I wanna caution you uh, that necessary work does not mean putting in, hey, uh, uh, I'm gonna put in my $100,000 chandelier, uh, because if that person redeems it, and they're not gonna give you a 25% premium, they're not gonna give you anything, you're gonna lose your chandelier is what's gonna happen. On the other hand, if you have to fix a roof and it's $10,000, they redeem it, they're gonna have to give you $12,500. If you change carpet, uh, if you have to paint it, uh, anything to make it livable, uh, you can get a 25% premium on that. So keep that in mind. I personally, you know, some people, their strategy is to just put tons and tons and tons of things into it that are necessary so that they make it as hard as possible for the homeowner to redeem. I don't personally do that. I like to create win-wins. And so uh, there's, there's much more uh, ethical ways to do that. But some people actually do that, try to make a premium on the uh, repairs. So uh, here's, here's a, uh, an example of one of the homes that my students got. Uh, picked it up for 15,300 fair market value, probably 80, 90 grand, give or take. And he just uh, kept it as a rental property. And, and at the time he bought it a few years ago, it was getting 900 a month on a $15,000 investment. Uh, rent's probably gone up since then. But there's a number of different strategies. Once you get these properties, uh, you can, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, I got to buy it. And then I, but then I've got to get money to fix it. So, you know, you might get that property for 15 grand and maybe it needs another 15 grand or 20 grand to fix it up. You don't necessarily have to do that. So one of the strategies uh, is a lot of time there's people, especially contractors, love fixer uppers and they like to do the sweat, sweat equity in the property. So you can just buy it for 15 if it's worth 80, you know, sell it for 30 or 40, double your money and go on to the next one. Uh, you can buy fix and flip, which is what most people think of when they go, think of these auctions. And uh, you can buy, rent it, and hold it, like my uh, student did. Uh, you can do vendor financing. And what I mean by that, you got it for 15 grand. Imagine you put an ad on Craigslist and said, you know, home for sale, vendor will carry, 15,000 down, no qualifying. You'd have, your phone will ring off the hook. What that means, if, you're, if, if you've never done something like that, is you're becoming the bank. And so you're, you're gonna basically take 15,000 down, so you've got all your money back. So you have no money tied to the deal. And then you're gonna let somebody else make a payment on the other $65,000 of that mortgage that you just created out of thin air. They're gonna give you a payment on that. So now you've created some passive income and now you have your money back to go back to the auction again the next month. And then I'm not sure if anybody on your uh, summit, I'm sure somebody has probably talked, has talked about the BRRRR strategy, but in case nobody has, you buy the property, you rehab it, you rent it, you refinance it, and then you repeat. And so, uh, you're not gonna be able to do that immediately. Most banks have uh, a certain seasoning period, but if you bought this home for 15 grand and it's worth 80, 
And let's say the banks are allowing you to do an equity takeout at 80%. Uh, you can take out $64,000 uh, for something you paid 15,000 for. Now you're gonna have a mortgage payment, but now you've got a lot more money to go back to the auctions with. So I don't know if that makes sense to all of you, uh, but uh, you know, bottom, bottom line is there's a lot of different things you can do once you get this property. It's not just, oh, I'm gonna fix it and flip it. That's just one of many different strategies. And sometimes that's the best one and sometimes, uh, sometimes it's not. So I always encourage my students to look at different potential exit strategies for the home and what's gonna uh, give the best, uh, the best result. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so basically, I just want to reiterate that two things can really happen. One is you're going to get the property 100% free and clear if you do your homework. Because sometimes you're not going to get it free and clear if you don't do your homework. You're going to get a surprise and not a good one. Uh, or uh, the homeowner is going to come back within six months. There's actually one exception. I don't want to get into a lot of details. But if it's a homestead, they actually have two years, but they have to give you 50%. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole because I don't know how much time I've got left. And I want to cover a lot more stuff with you guys. So as I mentioned, though, there's, way, there's ways to make money before, during, and after the auction. So just this morning, I actually went on uh, the website where you see the list of inventory. By the way, if you want to check it out, it's called publicans.com, P-U-B-L-I-C-A-N-S, publicans.com. And in Texas, there's uh, right now 4,494 properties are listed on the website right now. Um, as you can see, if you look at uh, the, the first one here, let's go through it, it tells you the sale date. Uh, which is July 7th. It's always the first Tuesday of the month. That may or may not happen. The auction was not open last month. I don't know if crowds of over 50 are allowed to congregate in Texas yet or not. Uh, in any case, uh, it may go for sale on July 7th. And the not yet. Not, we, we still got that, like 10 people or below for the most part. Or 10 or below. Okay. So that may or may not happen. The bottom line is eventually this will come up for sale at some point. But the judge value, now there's a legal process that uh, the county can't just, uh, you know, put your home randomly up at, on the auction block. They've got to go through a legal process. And they get, uh, they go in front of a judge and the judge uh, basically says, okay, the judge value is. And usually they'll go with whatever the county uh, tax records say the home is worth. So if something is, is shown to be worth 277,000, usually it's worth more than that. And the reason for that is, imagine you got your tax bill in the mail and it says your home is worth 277,000, but your home is really worth 200,000. You're gonna dispute it. And the county doesn't wanna deal with disputes. So they'd rather say, hey, your $300,000 home is worth 277, and now you feel like you're getting a good deal, so you just keep your mouth shut and you don't bug them. And they just raise the, what's called the mill rate, so they still get the, the tax they want without having you bug them. So anyway, that's uh, my little conspiracy theory for now. Uh, we won't go down that rabbit hole either. Uh, estimated minimum bid, $7,800. So this home is, the, the opening bid is gonna be $7,826. And so, but before the auction, when we see 4,494 property, what is this a list of? Besides this is a list is gold, but the other thing that it is, this is a list of people in trouble. And so if I were still doing my foreclosure fixers business, I'd be sending out, uh, to as many people as possible, I, I'd be selective. You know, I don't want every single home on there. Some of them are going to be crap. Some of them are going to be, uh, you know, just not not worth my while. But anything that's worthwhile, it looks like a good a good property. I'm going to be sending out my foreclosure fixer flyer. And by the way, this is a little bit different than what most people do. Most people, and you've all seen it though, and I, and I'm not criticizing it because it works too. But you know. People send out those postcards saying, you know, we buy, we pay cash for your home and we buy ugly homes. And I'm not criticizing people that do that because I used to do that too. What I did that was much, that had a much better conversion rate is I sent out something that said, hey, I can help stop your foreclosure. And I, I uh, hired a local attorney. I sat down with them, learned the foreclosure laws inside and out. And I would actually sit across the table from them, calm them down. Because like I said, a lot of them just thought they were going to get booted out of their home in the middle of the night. I tell them exactly what the process was. Some people I could actually uh, either stop the foreclosure or slow it down for them. Uh, quite often, like I said, I was lending, lending the money for the arrears and they could pay me back in installments. So I was being the lender. In other cases, I would do a joint venture with them. I'd say, hey, you know what? Why are you going to lose this to the bank? Why don't we fix it up? And they usually wouldn't have money. So I say, well, why don't I put up, you know, the 30,000 to fix it up. We'll put it on the MLS with a realtor. And, you know, when it sells, instead of giving, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing the work, I'm taking some risk here. So instead of 30, I'll take 40. And, you know, much, much better solution for these people than giving the home to the bank and getting nothing. So, uh, 
you know, there were lots of different strategies I could do when I got in front of these people. So I would try to save these people from losing their home. So that's how you can make money before the auction. You get this list usually a month in advance. And there's, of course, lists all over the country. This is just, you know, the, the uh, Harris County one. There's lists all over the country. And so a really great strategy is to try to help these people in distress uh, before they ever lose their home. Uh, then, of course, you can make money at the auction. Here's another example. Uh, here's one that opening or opening bid is 7,200 bucks. Property's worth 171. Once again, I, I, I want to set realistic expectations. Uh, in a lot of cases, these properties will get canceled before they ever happen. Remember, this stuff goes on a website a month in advance. And imagine you're the homeowner. All this time, you've been receiving stuff in the mail saying from the county saying, if you don't pay, eventually we're going to put your home for auction. You've been getting this for two or three years. It's like, yeah, whatever. They're never going to put it for auction. And then you finally get that notice saying, first Tuesday of next month, your home's going for auction. And then it becomes real for people. So these people start scrambling, you know, you know, before they were too proud to go ask their, their uh, friends or relatives for money. Now they're doing that. Or maybe somebody like myself who comes to them and says, hey, I can stop that foreclosure. This, so if that happens, this is going to get canceled. It's never going to make it to the auction. So it's not to say they never do because a lot of properties will change hands at every auction. But I just want to show you that you have to, if you get a little bit creative, you know, most courses teach you how do you make money at the auction, but you're missing the big picture of the stuff going on before. And I'm going to get to the stuff you can do after as well in a minute. So, uh, you know, so making money at the auction, uh, you have to be consistent, but if you go month after month, you will get deals. And uh, now here's how you make money after the auction. There's something called an overage. And what an overage is, is, you know, at these auctions, let's say the opening bid uh, is $5,000 on a property and it gets bid up and it ends up selling for 50,000. Well, the first $5,000, uh, you know, that belongs to the county fair and square. That is for the previous taxes, uh, that, that money's owed to them, but the additional 45,000, that's called an overage. And that money actually belongs to the previous homeowner. Most previous homeowners have no idea this money is owed to them. This is a list. This is what happens to be in Georgia of all these, all this money that the government is holding uh, that nobody has claimed. The only ones on there that are uh, being claimed are the yellow ones that are highlighted in yellow. Every single other one on there, the homeowner has no clue. They haven't gone to try to get those funds. And so a really amazing strategy that uh, you can do, and this is a great win-win for anybody who's, you know, feels unethical going to the auction, which I would not, you know, you're helping the county, you're keeping schools open, and these people had a million chances, and they still have another chance. But if you do feel, still feel guilty, and, and by the way, when you get the property, you can, if you want, you can try to make a deal with the homeowner, and if they're still in there, try to keep them in there, turn them into renters, whatever you want. But anyway, if you're still feeling guilty after all that, overage is the most ethical thing on the planet because the government is keeping people's money that's owed to them and they're making very little effort to contact them because that's their slush fund. They want to keep the money. So these homeowners have no idea. So imagine you go to somebody and say, listen, I know, and, and this person, you know, you're going to somebody who just lost their home. They probably have no money. And you go to them, listen, I know somebody owes you $45,000. If you're willing to allow me to, uh, you know, do what I do, I can get you that $45,000, but I want you know 20%, 30%, 40%, whatever you negotiate with them, uh, you can get a piece of that. And this is money they would have never had in a million years. So a lot of the people, when you contact them, are gonna be skeptical. They're gonna think you're scamming them. What uh, one of my buddies does, uh, and you can do this too, if you, if you decide to do this strategy, is uh, he gives them 10%. So if they're gonna get 45,000, he'll give them $4,500 upfront, as long as he knows he's gonna get that money once they sign the paperwork. So nobody's gonna be skeptical when you kind of check for 4,500 bucks to them. And so this stuff goes on, not just in Texas, this goes on all over the country. And this stuff happens every day. How many, how many auctions, you know, when there's no COVID, how many auctions are taking place every single day all across the country? And there's all these overages. This is just a small little cross section. So with overages, basically there's, there's three things you have to do. One is you get a list like this. Sometimes they're free. Sometimes there's a small charge to get them. Some counties make it very difficult to get the lists. Others publish it right online. Every county does it differently. So that's step one. Step two is tracking down the homeowners. Sometimes that's easy. Uh, sometimes not so easy. Sometimes you might have to hire a skip tracer, uh, which are basically almost like detectives. They, they find people and uh, track them down. Then the third step is just uh, you know, doing up some paperwork, submitting it to the county. And when the money uh, comes in, uh, you keep your portion and you give the other, other money to the, uh, to the homeowner the, or previous homeowner that's owed that money. So 
those are uh, those are some of the strategies that you can use with these lists that are coming out. There's so many different ways to monetize it, and these lists of foreclosures, pre foreclosures, uh, tax deeds, all these lists are going to get bigger and bigger because of this moratorium that's going on right now, and it's just going to be uh, there's going to be so many people in distress. And, and, and to me, like, like I said at the beginning, I love to be a problem solver. I like to uh, take people that are, you know, you know they're, they're always going to be depressed. They're going through a lot of bad stuff and put them in a much better spot. And then, you know, like I said, there, there's two different types of investors out there. There's, there's the people out there that will find some little, little old lady who doesn't know the value of her property so they can get a good deal. And those people will be in the business a very short time because it's very, you know, it's a, it's a pretty tight community. And, uh, and also, with, obviously, with the internet, uh, people can Google you, Google you and they know, your, they know your track record. Or you can do really, really good things and help other people. And not, you might make a tiny little bit less on some of the deals than you would if you were uh, a little bit more shrewd, I guess you could say. Uh, but uh, I believe in karma and I think great things start to happen to you the more people you help. And the other thing is, if you, if you find somebody who uh, is, is about to lose their home because they're losing their job, which is gonna be a lot of people right now, uh, guess what? All the other people they work with are going to be in the same boat. So they're going to refer their friends to you. And these people, like I said, you know, when bad things happen and they get knocked down, people get back up eventually, some, some faster than others. But eventually you're going to have a buyer if you keep in contact with them. And if you keep working with them, you're going to have a buyer down the road. And so this stuff just, uh, you kind of just get in the flow and stuff just keeps happening. Not just with this strategy, do ethical investing no matter what strategy you're doing. And uh, you'll have a much longer career. I've been doing this for 31 years and I still wake up, I still sleep very well at night and I wake up very excited every day to do what I get to do. So uh, here's a, uh, I'm just going to go into a little pitch here. I'm not, I'm not very salesy, uh, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to work with me. I take small uh, groups uh, to the auctions, uh, usually once or twice a year. Um, this is my last group. We did this just a little bit before COVID set in, uh, unfortunately. So we're waiting for the auction to reopen. I usually bring groups, uh, you know, 15 to 20 is kind of my, uh, you know, average size because I want to give everybody my undivided attention. And I do things a little bit differently than, you know, other courses that you may have gone to. So, so what we're going to, the next one, training, by the way, is October 3rd to 6th, uh, assuming that the uh, auction is open and we can get groups together. If not, if you uh, pay and it doesn't happen, you're going to get a refund if you can't make whatever the dates are that it gets switched to. Uh, this one is one that I, you know, I do other trainings online. This is one that I'll never do online. Uh, it's really important. Part, part of the strategy is actually going to the auction. So the first two days we're in a classroom, I'm teaching you pre-foreclosures, foreclosures, tax liens, tax deeds, overages. And I usually bring in some guest speakers as well that are, uh, you know, teaching other money-making strategies. My last one, I had a buddy of mine who uh, he started with uh, like just selling stuff around his house on uh, Amazon like three years ago and last year he sold one and a half million dollars worth of merchandise and of course we all know that online shopping is getting bigger and bigger and so he taught exactly how he built it what he buys what you know what he does from start to finish um, so I bring in guest speakers on a whole bunch of different topics for day one that's kind of the bonus day day two we get into pre foreclosures foreclosures all these different strategies here uh, we go in great great detail day three we do driving for dollars so day two we're, we're going over the list, we're doing what I call scouring the list, figuring out what properties make sense, which ones don't. Day three, we're actually driving around, looking at the homes, and then analyzing and figuring out, hey, well, if we bought this one, what would our exit strategy be? And what would our maximum bid be on this property? And how much is it gonna need for rehab? So we're, we're analyzing all the properties that are potentials for bidding on. And then on day four, we actually go as a group to the auction. You're actually, if you wanted to, in a position to go and bid. So uh, this is a, a $10,000 training. Uh, I'm giving a $2,000 discount to anybody who sees me on Scott's show here. Uh, like I said, it's a very, very small group and uh, it's by application only. And the reason for that is one, I need action takers. I don't, if, if I'm only taking 15 people, I don't wanna waste a seat on somebody who's not gonna do the work, not motivated. Um, I don't like to teach shelf help. I wanna see all my students succeed. So I do things a lot differently, as I mentioned. So one, you're going to get access to my teams on the ground, meaning that if you don't live in Houston, Texas, you can, you know, I've taught people from as far away as Australia, uh, you get access to my team. I have a team on the ground. Like I said, they can go videotape the properties. They can go do, you know, the, the rehab on your, on the home. They can go to the auction on your behalf. Everything can be done for you remotely, no matter where you live. 
So as long as you have access to the internet, which I assume if you're watching me, you have access to the internet. So there is some due diligence that you need to do every month. It's gonna take on average, uh, by the way, you're not even gonna start your due diligence. The first three weeks, you're gonna do nothing. Because remember I said some of those properties are gonna get canceled. So you don't wanna do, you know, invest the time and money into researching something and then three weeks later it's canceled. You wanna do your research like the three days, three or four days before the auction happens. So uh, you're gonna to need to devote three to four hours to be the quarterback of your team. You're gonna go through the list, figure out which ones you're interested in. Then you're gonna to delegate to my team. They're gonna go videotape properties for you. They're gonna pull title for you. They're gonna go through all the, all the pitfalls, all the places where you could uh, lose money and do the, do the things that need to be done uh, on the ground there for you so you don't make any mistakes. And uh, you get access to uh, myself as well. So you get access to my teams on the ground forever. Uh, you do have to pay them, by the way. So you pay them exactly what I pay them. It's very, very affordable. So, uh, you know, my buddy who goes to the auction on your behalf, if you don't get a property, it doesn't cost you anything, by the way. If you're successful, uh, last I heard, I was charging $500. So not a lot less than a you know, flight and hotel to go there month after month after month. Uh, you get one, ac one year access, direct access to me, which is why I do small groups, because normally I'm traveling. I don't want to, I, I couldn't handle a thousand people calling me the day, you know, the day before the auction to go over their work. Uh, but for 15 people, no problem. I can do that. So you get one year access. I say one year access to me. Uh, the truth of the matter is once you're in my family, you get access to me uh, forever, as long as we are getting along. And, uh, you know, I, when I get negative people, I usually... I know, and that's why I do an application now. I just like positive people that are going to do the work. And, and uh, uh, but anyway, once you're in my family, you're in there forever. So I don't cut you off after a year. Uh, I've, I haven't had to do that yet. Uh, but I've, I've been to other people's events where I've seen kind of troublemakers. Uh, I know none of you guys are like that. You wouldn't be following Scott. And you get to attend, you know, future events for free. So when I do it again, the next time you can come back a second time, you know, ref refresh. Uh, uh, get to meet, network with my new students, which I strongly recommend that you do. And, uh, you know, my goal is to make sure you succeed. I'm there to hold you by the hand. My teams are there to hold you by the hand. And, uh, you know, that's why I, I don't, you know, I don't do these cooking, you know, a lot, there's a lot of other classes that I attended myself and they're like $297 to get in and they get you in the door and then they upsell you to the $30,000 thing and the $50,000 thing. This, this is not an upsell event. This is where I give you everything that I know. And you also get, uh, you know, as I learn new stuff, if something, you know, if, if something new happens, like a couple of years ago, they changed the location of the auction. It used to be downtown. Now it's not downtown anymore. And now it's in a really fancy place. But we had to change our strategy a little bit because, you know, down, downtown attracted a different crowd. Uh, and the fancy place now uh, it attracts a different, a different type of investor. It attracts different, you know, different competition. So you can email me, uh, mike at mikewolfmastery.com, and that's, uh, we'll, we'll pick a time to jump on a, a call and see if this is right for you and see if we're a good fit for each other. And uh, if it interests you, I'd love to have you there. But now I want to answer uh, any questions that uh, uh, might have come up. It, uh, I'm not sure what's going on in the chat window there. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, leave, leave that up a little bit there. Uh, oh, sure, Michael absolutely. So people me, can uh, take it so, yeah. yeah, so people have the email there. there I've got go. a couple questions from folks yep. out there. Great stuff as always. Uh, Terry asked a question here. Do you have teams in other parts of the country? Or do you personally invest in other, or, or are you investing in other parts of the country, on other markets? Yeah, I've only, I, for, for this strategy, I've only got teams in, in Houston. Uh, one of the things when you have teams is, and I'm not sure if you, if, what, what kind of team you have, Scott, but uh, my experience is if I had three different teams, they're all going to be at best, they're going to be mediocre. I want to like specialize in one place, do it really, really well. So, so uh, my buddy, Brian, who goes to the auction on behalf of myself and my students, he has been to every auction for like the last nine years straight. He's never missed an auction. So he knows who your competition is. He knows their bidding style, their strategy, kind of what their maximum percentage they're going to, you know, he's our secret weapon. But if I was doing this at three or four different auctions, it's, it's very hard to have you know, really solid teams. I'd have mediocre teams. I'd rather just specialize, do something really well in one place. Now, I actually teach you at this event, I'm going to teach you how to build your own team. And you can just emulate what I've, what I've done. Uh, but you know, if you want to do it remotely at other places, I recommend that you do build a, a, a team. But I personally have not set up the teams for that. I do have a team in Atlanta, but that's for my turnkey properties. And so I usually pick my favorite market for doing 
my, the one thing there. And then that's just where I do it. And I build, uh, you know, my dream team, but trying to duplicate, you know, if you have too many people that you're, uh, you know, managing and, uh, you know, dealing, you know, putting out fires, uh, and you will have fires, the more, you know, the bigger you get. Uh, so I don't do that. No, it's, uh, that's, that's true. I mean, I only will rehab properties in Southwest Florida because mm -hmm. I have the best team down there or even here in Texas, but I'm not, I haven't bought anything that much in Texas except tax, if you tax liens and a few other uh, notes deals here, I'm not doing heavy fix and flips other parts of the country. Usually I'm just doing exactly like you said, streamline your team, streamline your focus. You'll be a lot happier. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. If you have too much going on, your bandwidth is divided up too many ways, then, then this isn't fun anymore. And to me, uh, this should be profitable. It should be ethical, and and, and we, you know you're you're happy because you're helping other people, and it should be uh, you know and obviously it should be uh, stress free. I think if, if this is you know we get into the into real estate to create freedom for ourselves, and if instead of the freedom we we're, we're living the workaholic lifestyle and we're putting out fires all the time, that's not that's not fun. That's not fun. No, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So let's get a couple of questions here. Sure. Um, uh, Nathan asks here, do you have to personally be at the auction or can you do it online or have an assistant representative be at the auction for you? Yeah. So uh, in, in this particular case in Harris County, it's not online. Somebody has to be there. It doesn't have to be you. So in, in the case of my students, they use, they use uh, you know, my bid by proxy person, uh, but you can certainly send somebody to represent you, uh, whoever, whoever you want. So you don't personally have to be there. Uh, the one thing I should mention, um, if you're going to the Harris County auction and uh, you have to have all the funds on you. So if you're going to that auction, uh, you can't say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go to the bank, I'm going to go to the ATM and go get the money, or you have to physically have the money on you. And it has to be either cashier's checks or cash. And so, uh, you know, so if you're sending somebody to represent you, make sure that they actually physically have the money on them when they attend that auction or you will get uh, banned from the auction. Yeah, that's so true. There's a lot. And that's why going to auctions or some here in Texas are a great way to find private money lenders too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, definitely. So true. Um, uh, he also has questions. Is there a typical range of return you see with getting properties via tax lien deed with auctions, um, price, uh, fair market values? It, it varies tremendously. It varies tremendously. And that's because, you know, at these auctions, you're going to see anything that has a property tax associated with it could end up on the auction block. And I've seen everything from, you know, vacant land to burnt out homes to uh, morgues to pubs. I mean, you name it, every, every type of property, commercial, uh, apartments. So it's just such a wide varying range. Uh, the strategy I teach is you, you will never be in for more than 70 cents on the dollar uh, on any property. If you're bidding more than that, it's not worth, it's not worth doing. I'd rather, I, there's other ways that I would get properties if I was gonna spend more than that. And, but in some cases, you know, depending on the neighborhoods, you know, like I said, I, I've seen stuff, we, we've got stuff worth, uh, you know, probably realistically, my, my client who got his property for 70, it was $7,200 he paid, it was realistically worth around 110,000. Uh, there's, there's such a wide variance. And it really also depends on, on where you're doing this. Because like I said, if you ha are, are going somewhere where there's a lot of institutional investors, they can afford to have very, very tight margins, because they're using our money that they're paying us they're charging us to hold on to our money. By the time you look at all the service fees, the banks charge. So in some places, especially if you're doing liens, they have something called bidding down. And what that means is, you know, the, it might start at, let's say 18% return on that lien. But then somebody says, oh, I'll do it for 16. I'll do it for 12. And by the time the bank is done that you're bidding on, they'll do it for 3%. Well, I'm not going to wake up in the morning for 3%. It's not, it's not worth, right. it's not worth doing it. And so, uh, so it really depends on where, where you're going, what you're bidding on. Uh, but for my, for my students, I, ha I have very strict uh, guidelines as to how high they should go. And, you know, really should be more, for more than 70 cents on the dollar in a really good situation. And that's after repair value. Yeah, that's a great, great uh, counsel there. Uh, Shelly asked, do you search property overages? Uh, so property overages, uh, yeah, that, that's part. That's part. That's part one. Is you have to search for the list, and, and uh, you know some counties make it very, very difficult. And they'll give you the runaround, and they don't want to give you the list. By law, they they are supposed to and have to, but they'll always not not all of them. Some make it very difficult. Places like Georgia, that list I just showed you, I just pulled it up this morning. It's online, so and, and it's free. So you can you can uh, uh, you can do that uh, just by googling the name of, of the the county that you're interested in. 
and then put uh, overages and uh, you'll find it. So, but that's part one. Part, part two is finding the people. And then part three is making sure you do the paperwork uh, properly. And that's some of the stuff that we teach is how, one, how do you track down these people? Uh, how do you get, uh, you know, how do you find the, the lists and the places that are harder to get the lists? And, you know, how do you monetize it? How do you, how do you get the proper paperwork with the homeowners? Because if you don't do it right, uh, they can actually circumvent you and not pay you. So you have to be really careful how you do that. But yeah, finding the list uh, can be either really easy or really difficult, depending on what county. Uh, but, you know, they're all over the U.S. They're everywhere. So uh, it's just a little bit detective work to figure out how to get them. Uh, Matrix asked a question. He's in Georgia and your class is in Texas. And how long is the class? The class so is four days. Yeah, it's four days. So uh, it's uh, the fir first day is, uh, the first day, like I said, is a bonus day and, and we teach a whole bunch of money-making strategies, a, whole a little bit of creative uh, ways to do deals so you understand the BRRRR strategy, so you understand vendor financing. Uh, I'm going to teach you a whole bunch of different kind of more outside-the-box strategies that most people don't talk about because most people, when they, when they go to these auctions, all they think is, okay, fix and flip, fix and flip, you know, buy, fix and flip. And so in their mind, they think, oh, I got to come up with money to fix it. How much is it going to cost? And nothing can be further from the truth. I mean, actually, a lot of times the best money is just selling it exactly as is. And sometimes, especially if you have a buyer's list, you can sell it while you're at the auction. You picked it up, make a phone call, sold to somebody else and make a profit. Because a lot of people don't know how to do these auctions. One of the best ways, by the way, if you don't have a lot of money uh, to raise money, and this is one of, the, one of the strategies I teach, is... You know, if you, if you come to a, a training like this and you know how to do something other people don't know how to do, and then you go back to Georgia, for example, and you go to a, a, a networking event, you go to a meetup group, and it's, you know, everybody says, oh, what do you do? They say, hey, I specialize in Texas tax deeds. And you go, what the heck are Texas tax deeds? And why do you do it in Texas? And then it gives you permission to explain exactly what you learned and what you know. And you know, you're never going to lie to a, a prospective investor. You're never going to lie. But you could very easily and legitimately say, hey, here's some deals. Here's some examples of some deals that my team has done. And then you can show uh, you know, the case studies of some of my other students. Because you're going to have the exact same team that found these deals for my other students. As you say, here's some of the deals that we've done. And the only thing stopping you from doing more deals is we're looking for more money. And who goes to these networking groups? There's some people with money looking for deals and some people with deals looking for money. So, uh, so now, you, you know, the first question they're going to ask is, well, you know, they're not going to know that you know what you're doing, but if you show these case studies and now you say, hey, and I've got a team on the ground in Texas, they're ready to go. We just have to put a little bit more money into this machine and this is what we're going to do. So for people who don't have a lot of cash, you know, my, my client who got that, that home for $7,200, that wasn't even his own $7,200. It was somebody else's $7,200. So uh, you don't have to use your own money. You just, uh, one of the things I teach students is when you don't have a lot of resources, you've got to become resourceful. And when you do that, uh, you know, the, the great thing about these auctions, oh, by the way, the other, the other thing I forgot to mention is at the same auction at the same time, there's bank foreclosures going on at the same time. So there's literally, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of properties going on, uh, being, you know, changing hands. And uh, so there's so much opportunity there. So if you're raising your, your real job because you already have a team is you're going to do a little bit of homework, like three days before the auction, maybe four or five hours. But your real job, if you don't have money, is to go raise money. And I, I teach you exactly how to do that. So, but whenever you have a strategy that everybody knows how to do, nobody's going to give you their money. When you know something that other people don't have a clue and they can't circumvent you because if they went to the auction themselves, they're going to lose their money really quick. If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to buy that hundred foot strip of land is what you're going to end up with thinking you got the villa. So, uh, so when you know how to do something that other people can't do, uh, that's gold. And so, uh, so that's what I recommend is just doing a little bit of due diligence, delegate the rest of the team and be networking and raising money. And, and the more money you have, the bigger the deals you can do or finding joint venture partners. So lots of different ways you can play with that. Right. Um, it, Matrice also asked, what's the, uh, how much is your class again? I think that's the previous slide where you had that broken down. Is yeah, that so it's basically uh, for, for your people, it's 79.97. Uh, and like I said, it's not, it's not one of those things where everybody's trying to pitch you something. It's, it's, that's it. You're going you're to get everything. It's a, it's a four day go to put your ass to work workshop, right? Absolutely. You're going to, you're going to be working. We're going to be cruising around looking at properties. We're going to be work, going to the auction. We're going to be having a uh, lot of fun, uh, but it's going to be work too. And, and like I said, the, the thing that I like, and, and by the way, uh, you can bring your spouse for free. If you, if, uh, uh, I, I really encourage people to do this with their uh, significant other because 
you know, my marriage is, is no longer as a result of the fact that I was so passionate about my real estate, I, become, I became a workaholic and I really wasn't at home as much as I should have been. And I see it happen, not just with real estate investors, but entrepreneurs in general. So I encourage you to bring your spouse for free. If you have a business partner, they can come for half price. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, def definitely bring your spouse along if they have any interest at all in real estate. And like I said, the other really cool thing is you get to come back for free. And uh, you know, as you become su more successful, you might become one of my speakers down the road as well. Because uh, a, lot, a lot of my students have used this as a springboard to go down, do a lot of pre foreclosure work and do overages. And so I bring my students in to speak on a lot of that stuff because I just don't have, uh, you know, a lot of these strategies, uh, like I said, I used to do the tax deeds a lot. Now I, I don't do them at all. I, I basically have that as my training ground for my students. So, uh, because I need much more volume of properties. So the good news is you can come back, you can network with my students. A lot of my students do joint ventures together, uh, put their, pull their resources and it's just a really good environment. And that's why I'm very protective of it. And that's why I have that application. Cause I want to see, you know, you don't have to have any experience by the way. I'm not, I'm not seeing, oh, are you a pro investor? I actually like working with people who've never done a real estate deal. Uh, so my, especially young people, but I really just want to see that you're, you have a positive outlook. You're not one of those, uh, you know, there's so many people right now and, and, and I hate to say it because obviously it is really tough times out there, but a lot of people become victims and they let, you know, they let circumstances dictate their life. And I say, I, I say the people that are rising up to take this downtime to educate themselves and better themselves, they're the people are going to take advantage of this, you know, wealth transfer that's coming up. And I want to be there to, to coach them and help them. And I also want ethical investors. I want people that want to do win-wins because that's my pre-foreclosure stuff all about win-win for sure. Yeah, great, great stuff there. Definitely you want to limit the, the amount of access and, and that for especially those that aren't going to be a, a positive energy. We need to eliminate the negative as much as possible. You don't want somebody Debbie Downer affect yeah, everybody else yeah. as well too. Jason asked a question for overages. How can the investor apply for that money on behalf of the homeowner if it is not theirs to claim? Yeah, that's, that's uh, part of the course. It's obviously more than I can teach you in, in the time I've got here. But in, in general, you've got to get a... A limited power of attorney is, is kind of the starting point with it, which gives you permission to act on their behalf. That's the starting point, but there's a whole lot of paperwork, uh, which basically protects you, make sure you're going to get paid. Uh, because obviously if the whole check were to go to the owner and they're responsible for cutting a check, you're probably not going to see it. So there's a, there's a whole lot of paperwork and that paperwork is going to vary from location to location. Yeah. Uh, but we actually give you some of this uh, paperwork and we also teach you some of the more there's some ninja tips on how to uh do this uh, uh more effectively uh so uh but the starting point is to get limited power of attorney because you normally if you approach a government office saying hey i want this money and you're not that person you're not going to get it so yeah and that's you know, that answers patrick's question with over as soon as you contact the previous homeowner and tell them about the overage money what stops them from going to get the money themselves most of the time it's the paperwork they just don't know well, they, they, just don't know, they just don't know where the money's coming from. You're not gonna yep. say, hey, you know, your home just went up for auction. You're just gonna say, hey, I know somebody who owes you X amount of dollars. You're not gonna, you're not gonna tell them exactly where it is because then they could uh, go around you. And even, even uh, you know, even if you told them, some of these people are just like in a really bad state. They're just like so depressed and so down. Uh, a lot of them are just not thinking clearly and they really need you to help them get it anyway, to be honest. So they're just not in a good position. Yeah, exactly. Um, question here, Robert says, Would, wouldn't the first mortgage lender pay off the taxes if they move to foreclose? And the answer is you would think that, yeah, but no, they don't always. You got to realize banks and lenders have thousands and thousands of these deals. And we see this happen quite a bit in, in buying non-performing firsts. Private sellers, smaller institutions, smaller companies that have bought portfolios don't keep track of it. It goes to tax foreclosure and you can step in and pick that up as a getting now. Yes, well, get, as Mike said, you got you don't really start doing your due diligence till about three till about a week out because the fact is yes they get notices if it's the correct then they'll pay it a lot of times but there's still plenty that goes to tax foreclosure every month that they just missed out on and, and then also it's good to know what type of redemption periods are in different states out there as well too because some don't have and some do have redemption periods and it's important to know so when i i've got notes in 30 states so that's one of the things that we do on a constant basis checking taxes and and, and checking that stuff so. Yeah, that's the, the other. The other thing is, you know, the banks. A lot of times, uh, especially back in, in the olden days, two thousand seven, two thousand eight. I think we may see some of this now. A lot of times, the banks, their mortgage 
is worth more than the home. And so they're just throwing you know, more money away. And so they just don't want it. They don't want to be in the real estate business. And quite often we have a crisis like this, they're going to get bailed out by the government anyway. So it's like, oh, we don't want to do all that work. We'll just let the government give us money. So uh, yeah. yeah, so we, we do see a lot of these that did have mortgages on them and the mortgages got wiped out. The bank didn't bother to, you know, they just didn't want, they didn't want to deal with it. So we see that all the time. Exactly. Uh, and let's see here. Uh, yeah, a couple people asking, would you be kind enough to repeat the name of the public tax deed auction website? Absolutely. It's called publicans.com. P-U-B-L-I, the word public, and then A-N-S.com. Publicans.com. And there's, uh, if I remember correctly, there's a, uh, a little tab that says tax taxes or something. And then there'll be a separate one that says tax deeds. And it'll list the uh, inventory. The inventory might be uh, pretty limited relatively speaking, uh, this month because they don't know if the auction is going to open or not. So a lot of them may, may say future sales. So it'll be interesting to see when things do open up again. But uh, yeah, that's exactly where you go. And that, that will get you, that's for all of Texas. And I believe they do uh, Philadelphia as well, that particular law firm that handles that. Cool. Well, Tree, I asked a question. Vacant lands would be my niche. Is there a specific starting point? Yeah, sign up for Mike's class, Matrice. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about vacant land, the great thing is, you know, there, there's less people interested. So I'm going to give you a little, little tip. You know, uh, most people, when they're looking through the list, they, they see the pretty homes. And that's what everybody wants. Oh, look at that. That's a beautiful home. You're not going to live in this home. You're not going to live on that. You know, so you're not looking for... Uh, you're not looking for the home of your dreams unless you're actually planning on buying it to, to move into. If you're looking at it as an investment, the, the not so pretty homes are the ones that are, are less competition, the vacant land even less competition because people want the pretty stuff. Or that's what catches our eyes. So that's where your competition is also going. So go for the stuff. Uh, my, my favorite property isn't the pretty one. My favorite property is the one with the nicest paycheck that comes with it. So, so keep that in mind. For, for vacant land, I'll give you one uh, tip. There's a lot of things you need to know, but the, the biggest thing, make sure uh, you do your research, make sure it's not landlocked. So sometimes you will get uh, a piece of land that you have no, you can't get to it unless you go on somebody else's property to get to. So unless you own a helicopter, you can't even get to it. And even if you could, nobody's going to buy it from you. So that's one thing to really be careful of. Uh, another pointer, and this would have saved that person who bought that 100 strip of land, would it would have saved them 10,000 bucks right there, which would have paid for my course, is if the address says zero such and such a street, if it's a zero address, that's vacant, vacant land. So very easily avoidable uh, for people that know what they're doing and very easy landmine for people that don't have a clue. So look for a zero address and that means that uh, there's no property there. Now, having said that, there may, there may be an address and that means that there was a home there at one point. It doesn't mean that the home is still there. So also keep that in mind. Yeah, we've seen that in different parts of the country, looking at notes and there's an address and it looks, it's a vacant lot, but it was basically a house was demolished or torn down or, you know, or, or what up in smoke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially these riots going on. Who knows? What, I mean, who knows what's going on in some of these places, so. Yeah, that's the, that's the truth, it definitely out there. Matrice says, I'm, sign, I'm, I'm filling on an application, sign up, which is oh, awesome. Good. I can't so. like get on a call. And by the way, all the calls are with me personally. So you can also ask some more questions there as well. And I, and I want to make, you know, we're basically getting into a, a bit of a business marriage here. And, uh, you know, you're stuck with me, I'm stuck with you. And so, uh, like I said, I like, to, I like to have people, I like to call my community my family. And I don't, and so far I haven't had to, you know, deny somebody after the one year. I just give myself that little escape clause in case I do get that bad apple one day. But so far, uh, touch wood, uh, I seem to attract really good people and it seems like you do too. So, uh, but, uh, but yeah, definitely we'll get on a call. There's no obligation. I'm not, I'm, I am not a pushy salesperson. Uh, I, my events sell it every single time. So I'm not worried. If it's not you, somebody's going to take that spot. I'm not worried about that, but I want to get the, the best fit for it because, you know, this is going to be my first event post COVID and I want to train the go-getters because there's going to be so much opportunity, especially, you know, oh my gosh. Uh, these auctions open back up. It's going to be crazy. The number of properties that they're going to have to try to liquidate. And you know that, Scott. Oh my, and you're going to see that residential. You're going to see that in the commercial side. I mean, yes. Okay. Uh, you know, the first thing, I, I love the first thing, but the, the, the one thing that we always have to worry about that we get trumped by is the taxes. So we've always got to check it. So the, the closer you are to the, the money, everybody, the bank always gets paid, and you know who gets paid before the bank? The county, the That's government. Right. Government always gets paid. Yeah, so I'm excited you're in Houston. I mean, the Houston there, at Harris County, uh, big event usually. I mean, there's usually quite a few hundred of people at it, depending on what's going on on the month there. 
But yeah, I, I'm like, so most of the people have no clue what they're doing that are there though. That's they're all trying to figure it out and they think, oh, I'll just watch it. When you go to the auction with me, you're gonna see that had you not taken the course, if you just randomly showed up the auction, it is a really good place to lose a lot of money. If you know what you're doing, it's a great, it's a great place. And like I said, I always like to, I don't, I don't want to get people excited where they think, hey, I'm just gonna go to the first auction, I'm gonna become a millionaire and then retire. <laughs> There's gonna be work. You're gonna go, it's sometimes gonna be frustrating. You're gonna go there and do a lot of research. You're not gonna get anything. Other times you do lots of research, you get one or two. And you know, that, that if you do a couple of deals a year, you can definitely supplement your income very well with that. Yeah, definitely. I, I love in your presentation now, you have the Texas triangle of the growth because mm -hmm. that is such a big thing, especially between the Austin and San Antonio corridor up to Dallas and then across to Houston and then across like the I-10 corridor there. Um, it, everybody's moving in that neck of the woods, you know, it's moving in. When they say they, uh, they're looking at Austin, they say in 10 years, the middle of the city will be 20 miles west of where it's at right now. That's crazy, right? You know, it's, it's crazy. It is definitely a lot of growth growing up out that neck of the woods, Smithville, LaGrange, and that Texas Triangle and stuff like that too. So excited that you're doing some stuff there. Uh, yeah, that's a great place. Next time I'm in your neighborhood, we'll definitely have to uh, get, it, get together when we can, I think that's coming. I guess in Texas. You, know, you let me know the dates. I'll drive out to Houston to spend a day with you and, and show you yeah. some good barbecue joints out in there. Well, I want to learn from you because I want to learn more about notes. That's not something I've done a lot of. So hey, we'll hey definitely, brother. Definitely, man. Well, uh, any other final questions for Mike before we let him get back to his Saturday? Uh, it is Saturday, not Monday, Tuesday, exactly. Wednesday. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, go to Mike at MikeWolfMastery.com. Send me an email, uh, get in the Even application you just have process. Questions, feel free to reach out to. I mean, it's, you, you know, I'm happy to answer your questions within reason. If it's something that takes like five hours and I teach five hours at my event, I'm not, I'll teach you the, the basics, but, um, but yeah, so feel free to reach out. Doesn't, doesn't uh, have to be because you're signing up. And like I said, I'm not there to give you a high pressure sales pitch. If you're a good fit for me, I'd love to have you there. If for whatever reason it doesn't work, or if you maybe need a payment plan, let me know. We'll figure something out. Perfect. Good stuff there. Well, Mike, thank you so much uh, for uh, coming on um, and, and being a part of Note Camp and really delivering and over delivering and sharing some great nuggets out there on this stuff today. Appreciate yeah, it. So thanks much, for Mike. having me, Scott. It's so good to see you. And uh, just, uh, just very grateful for you having me here. Yeah, no problem. We'll touch base ne next week on some things. All righty. Done deal. Love it. Love you, bud. All right. Take care. We'll talk to you soon.